Well, thank you very much, Governor. It's, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for their, their very kind invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at this conference, this very prestigious conference after so many years. And of course, it's a particular pleasure to speak after Lars, with whom we have been exchanging views, let's say, uh, since the mid-2000s at least. So last time I was here, that was in 2008, I explored the causes and consequences of financial instability, as well as the implications of its fuzzy measurement for policy. And I outlined the contours of an operational macroprudential framework to tackle financial instability. And this is something that we had been advocating at the BIS since the early 2000s. Now, at the core of that analysis was the notion of the financial cycle and its macroeconomic costs. I also noted, however, that a more balanced framework to address the financial cycle and financial instability in general would call for the use of other policies as well, monetary policy, but also, I would say, fiscal policy. Today, I would like to focus firmly on monetary policy, and I will do so bringing together a number of pieces of work that we have been doing over the years at the BIS with, with colleagues. Um, the main thesis of my presentation is that monetary policy has been caught in a kind of pincer movement, caught between, on the one hand, the emergence of disruptive financial cycles, and on the other, an inflation rate that has proved quite insensitive to domestic slack. To my mind, the response to this challenge will define monetary policy in the future. There are basically three takeaways from my presentation. The first is the need to reconsider the natural rate as uh, its analytical basis and its role in policy. Somewhat provocatively, I will raise the question of whether the natural rate as traditionally conceived is part of the solution, or whether perhaps it might not be part of the problem. The second takeaway is the need for monetary policy to take the financial cycle more systematically into account, which doesn't mean more strongly, but it does mean more systematically into account. And there I will highlight the importance of, of, moving, of moving, uh, responding early and not to wait for the obvious signs of financial imbalances to stare you in the face. And the third uh, takeaway is the need for greater room for maneuvering current frameworks so as to allow you to have this somewhat more financial stability oriented policy and I will mention a number of options. So the structure of my presentation, first of all I'll say a few words about the pincer movement, then I'll turn to the discussion of the natural rate and there I will present some new evidence, new empirical evidence. I will then suggest reasons why it might be desirable for monetary policy to uh, take uh, financial stability more into account. And, and then I will consider some possible adjustments to monetary policy frameworks. Now, there are quite a number of graphs in, in my presentations which are there to support the points that I will be making, but in, in the interest of time, I might at most show one of them. But of course, we can look at them later if they come up in the question and answer session. So, the pincer movement. The first element of the pincer movement is the emergence of larger and more disruptive financial cycles. By financial cycle, I mean the self-reinforcing interaction between credit, risk-taking and asset prices, and particularly property prices, that tends to generate financial expansions followed endogenously by financial contractions or financial booms and busts. Now, for the purposes of my presentation, there are three key features that I think we should bear in mind. The first is that these financial cycles are considerably longer than the traditional business cycle. By traditional business cycle, I mean the way that we as policymakers or as academics measure the business cycle, which is with a duration of up to eight years, or eight, 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 eight to ten years. That's basically what the filters say. Now, if you're interested in financial cycles that cause major disruptions to the real economy, then these cycles tend to be longer, possibly even twice as long as the traditional business cycle. And the second, <clears throat> the second point is that these, the financial busts of these cycles tend to cause major and long-lasting damage to the economy. 
This is uh, true even, the, even if financial crises do not arise, but there is clearly plenty of evidence out there that suggests that the cost of the crisis can be, it can be even permanent in the sense that output may go back to its previous growth path, but it will be evolving along a parallel but lower, lower trajectory. Moreover, in some work, empirical work that we have done recently, we have found that one of the key mechanisms through which the financial cycle causes damage to the real economy, particularly in the form of long-lasting reductions in productivity growth, occurs through the misallocation of resources that takes place during the boom, resources that are shifted towards sectors with lower productivity growth, such as construction or possibly even the financial sector. And then somehow, when these resources have to be uh, uh, sort of taken back towards a more uh, a normal trajectory during the past, there are frictions that possibly create this long-lasting scarring effects. And the third feature, which is very important, is that the size and the amplitude of these cycles is not a constant of nature, but depends crucially on the regimes in place. It depends on the financial regime, first and foremost. So financial liberalization has given a lot of room for these phenomena to occur. And it is also, it, ha it also, I think, depends on monetary policy regimes. Because uh, the, um, the establishment of anti-inflation policy regimes that focus exclusively on near-term inflation, near-term inflation, and which disregard the information content that may be in credit and monetary aggregates, means that such policy may unwittingly uh, contribute to the build-up of financial imbalances if, as we have seen, these imbalances can easily build up in a context of low and stable inflation, or indeed inflation below objectives. Which brings me to the second point of the Pinsa, element of the Pinsa movement, which is an inflation rate which has proved to be quite insensitive to domestic economic slack. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. It's been there for at least a couple of decades, and it's evident in the muted and seemingly declining response of wages and prices to economic slack. Now, a popular explanation for this, particularly before the crisis, was that it had to do with central bank credibility, which was effectively uh, uh, making sure that the shocks that occurred were not translated into high wages and prices because agents would expect the central bank to, to react. But another possible explanation, complementary explanation, which I find quite attractive, is that persistent positive supply side factors have been at work. And an obvious one is globalization. By globalization, I mean the entry of the former Soviet bloc uh, countries of China and also of some emerging market economies such as India into the world trading system and the concomitant increase of global value chains. The entry of these countries amounted to an increase of 1.6 billion people to the effective labor force, which one sh we should have expected to reduce the pricing and wage and uh, pricing power of both labor and businesses, and at the same time making domestic pr price pressures more responsive to global, global conditions. I mean, more specifically, one can think of globalization as having had two types of effect. One is at the cyclical frequency, which is for reducing the relevance of domestic slack and increasing the relevance of global slack. And the other, probably even more important one, is at the lower frequencies, putting persistent downward pressure on inflation. As, as a series of positive supply side shocks, persistent shocks would do. Now, looking back, I think that globalization has been the big shock of the, of, of the last 20 years, but looking forward, I think that technology could actually have a similar effect through very much similar channels. <laughs> So, this pincer movement has raised challenges for monetary policy. Globalization may have added fuel to the financial cycle by putting downward pressure on inflation while raising expectations about potential growth, something which was clearly clear before the financial crisis. And indeed, it has not been uncommon for countries to experience persistent inflation below target, sometimes outright deflation, alongside good growth and financial booms. This was true pre-crisis, but it has been especially common post-crisis. 
If you look around the world, now examples abound, not so much here in Latin America, but if you look at countries in the Asia Pacific region, if you look at some countries in Europe, like such as, for instance, Switzerland and the Nordic countries, and if you want to pick up another example, if you look at Israel. Now, this raises the paradox that seeking to fight a good or benign deflation by reducing interest rates as a financial boom uh, develops could turn into a bad deflation once the boom gives way to a bust. Let me also note that, in fact, historically, the link between deflations and uh, output weakness is rather tenuous. I mean, research has basically found that most the, the clearest link comes from the episode of the Great Depression. Moreover, if you control for the behavior of asset prices during that phase, and particularly I'm thinking of equity, but property prices during that phase, then the link with price deflation tends to disappear. And while it is easy to find uh, evidence of a costly interaction between debt and property prices through history, it is much harder to find such a evidence for the interaction between debt and falling prices. Now, what do I take from this? I take basically two or three implications. First of all, that in considering the costs of deflation, of falling prices, one has to consider the factors that are driving it. And this is something which I think is important, central banks try to do, but it's something that we should never forget. And second, that the importance of the financial cycle has probably been underestimated compared with the importance of um, deflation. And these are some of the graphs that are making the points I've just made. So this analysis has significant implications for the notion of the natural rate and its use in policy. You will recall that the natural rate is defined as that real interest rate that prevails when output is at potential or full employment. In the standard notion, this rate is determined exclusively by real factors. Factors that drive saving investment balances, such as out output growth, productivity growth, demographics, the real price of capital, the return on capital income distribution, if you like, the, the usual suspects. And this notion, in turn, is underpinned by another notion, which is the notion that money is neutral in the long run, so that once you allow prices and all the variables in the system to adjust, changes in monetary policy can only affect prices. Now, this is the notion which is, of course, at the basis of popular hypotheses such as the secular stagnation hypothesis or the save, uh, saving glut. And it is behind the claim that the decline in real interest rates to these very low levels that we see today, even negative levels, and persistently negative levels, reflects a decline in the natural rate. But how convincing is the evidence about this? Well, I would suggest that it's probably less convincing than normally thought. Any empirical evidence confronts three problems. The first is that the notion of the long run that I mentioned before is purely an analytical notion, and that has to be translated into calendar time, which is the only relevant one for policy. The second is that the natural rate is an unobservable, model-dependent concept. And the third is that we know we know that mar the market rate is determined by a combination of central bank and market participants' actions. So how can we tell? How can we tell whether the market rate coincides with the natural rate? Or put differently, what kind of compass guides these actors, these economic actors, who set the market rate to take it towards the, the natural rate? I think all this raises a certain risk of circularity in the, in the tests that, that we do. And let me, let me sort of uh, explain this a bit more. Translating the analytical concept of the long run into calendar time is relatively straightforward. One assumes that the long run is something like a zero frequency or most of the ca in most cases be, uh, could be as long as a decade, although some, quite a number of people would say that it could be much shorter. But, but addressing the other two problems, I think, is, if you like, more problematic. Because the natural rate is an unobservable uh, concept, tests rely heavily on maintained hypotheses. That is, hypotheses that are simply assumed to be true in order to be able to make any inferences, so that data are allowed to speak, but only within very tight constraints. And because we know that 
we don't know whether rates, uh, the market rates and natural rates coincide, the tests either assume that that is the case or postulate unreliable compasses driving, uh, driving economic agents' behavior. Now consider the, main two, the two main approaches in this context. The first one simply assumes that over the relevant horizon, the market rate tracks pretty closely the, the natural rate. It then focuses on the postulated saving investment determinants of the natural rate to see whether they're broadly consistent, at least qualitatively consistent, with the behavior that you see in the data. But in doing so, it doesn't really test the underlying model. The second approach seeks to filter out the natural rate from the market rate. You, I think you're quite familiar, for instance, with the Laubach Williams seminal work here. And here it is precisely inflation that provides the key signal. And of course, the inflation relationship is underpinned by a Phillips curve. So that when inflation rises, it is inferred that output is above potential. And when inflation falls, it is inferred that output is below potential. And this is really the basis for central banks' practice sometimes to reduce their estimates of the natural rate of unemployment or of the NIRU when they see that despite other measures suggesting that uh, output is close or at, uh, at potential, inflation is not increasing. And this is something which is happening <coughs> these days. But this is precisely the relationship that, as I suggested, has proved so hard, so elusive to find in the data. Now, how can one break out of this circularity? Well, I think that an obvious way of trying to do that is to allow the data to speak a bit more, so to give a key role to the observable variables in the tests. And this is what we have just done in, in, in a piece of work which is circulating within the central banking community and academic community for comments before we put it out as a working paper. What we do there is we go back to the 1870s, we look at 19 countries, and we look at the link between long but also short rates and in particular filtered natural rates a la Laubach-Williams, and the link between these variables and the usual suspects that I mentioned earlier. And we compare that with the role of monetary policy. Going back in time is essential because the, any relationship that one might observe in the period which is typically used to understand what's going on with real interest rates, which is going back to the early 80s or early 90s, any relationship that one could see there could be simply coincidental. So we come up with two key findings. The first is that the usual suspects work reasonably well in the standard sample, in the standard recent sample, but they do not work well if you go beyond that. There is no consistent pattern that emerges. The signs are a little bit all over the place, the size of the, si of the coefficients also, which I think is a telltale sign that the relationships that we may be seeing could be spurious. And the second is that by contrast, there is evidence that monetary policy regimes matter. They matter for the average level of the interest rates and for the trend of the real interest rates over specific periods. Now, let me just make a couple of, mention a couple of examples of the possible relevance of monetary policy regimes in affecting interest rates even over long horizons. Now, this may not be neutrality in the long run, it may still be neutral in the long run, but I'm really talking about horizons that are relevant for monetary policy. For monetary policy. And the first is the classical gold standard. At the time, and it, this actually came up on the first day, at the time central banks did not respond systematically to output and inflation as they do today. They simply tended to keep nominal rates reasonably constant unless the convertibility constraint into gold came under threat, at which point they would raise them, particularly in the core, in the core country, which was the UK. So that gold acted as an anchor for prices but only over very long horizons. And yet inflation, despite the fact that interest rates were, nominal rates were hardly, were very much constant, or pretty much constant, inflation did not get out of control. Prices either fell gradually or they rose gradually over time. Of course, there was quite a bit of short-term volatility and this was simply because of the composition of the index. Now, as a result, both nominal and real interest rates were remarkably stable and tended to coincide. Now, the standard approach would infer that the market rate was very close to the natural rate. And yet the usual suspects, those real variables, the underlying determinants of saving and investment, tended to be just as variable over that sample as they are today. 
Another possible interpretation is that monetary policy had persistent impact on real interest rates without having a very tight near-term near impact on, on inflation. The other example comes from a reinterpretation of, of what may have been occurring over the recent sample going back to the early 80s. The first point to note is that the beginning of the sample, the early 80s, is rather unusual. Interest rates were extraordinarily high by historical standards then because one central bank in particular, the Fed, was trying to bring inflation down. This was the Volcker shock. So that the starting point is rather unrepresentative and already embeds an important role for monetary policy. The second possible factor is that the asymmetric responses to successive financial and business cycles, so that you do not lean against the build-up of imbalances, but you actually reduce policy in a very aggressive and above all persistently, uh, f a persistent form following the bust, could have tended to reduce real interest rates over time. And another possible explanation may have to do with possible difficulties in pushing inflation up, particularly post-crisis, as the globalization tailwinds pre-crisis became headwinds and welcome headwinds once the real problem was trying to get inflation back towards target. In a context in which it may be difficult to induce the second round effects, monetary policy may have, would ha tend to have a transitory impact on, on inflation, so, but not a permanent one, so that you would, would need further reductions in nominal rates in order to try and get, hit, hit your target. But in the process, of course, real rates would decline. It's as if monetary policy was not able to get sufficient, sufficient traction. These are some of the graphs on real interest rates. So, Why, if this analysis is correct, why would it make sense or there may be grounds for monetary policy to respond uh, to the financial cycle more, more systematically? Let me mention four reasons. The first is the weaker link between monetary policy and, and inflation. That weaker link increases any collateral damage of very low and persistently low interest rates on the, on the economy. And there are a number of mechanisms here, but let me just mention one that I think has not received the attention that it deserves, which is what I call the risk of a debt trap. And that is that asymmetric policy responses over successive financial and, and associated business cycles, coupled with the long-lasting damage that financial cycles generate for the real economy, could, on the one hand, lead to a a downward bias in, in real interest rates, a decline in real interest rates, and an upward bias in aggregate debt levels, private and public debt, as well as a loss of ammunition over time, which on the one hand would make it very hard for central banks to fight even a garden variety recession, and on the other hand would make it even hard for them to raise interest rates to raise interest rates without causing the damage that they were trying to avoid, simply because over the interval, the, the debt has been accumulating uh, in the economy. And let me just show you a simple, one of the only one graph, which shows how since the, min, in mid, uh, since the early or mid 80s, we have seen a decline in real interest rates over time, and at the same time, an increase in the global uh, debt to GDP ratio uh, in the world. Now, I think to my mind, this points to a form of time inconsistency, which is probably more insidious than the one that we're used to in the context of inflation. And here, the role of the debt service ratio is, is quite important, and I will come back to that. The second reason is that macroprudential measures are unlikely to be able to address the financial cycle on their own. Even in emerging market economies, economies where macroprudential measures have been used aggressively, we still see the sign of the build-up of the financial imbalances, strong credit growth, strong property price increases, which are qualitatively similar to those that we saw pre-crisis in the economies that later on had trouble. Now, of course, these macroprudential measures are bound to increase the resilience of the financial system but they have not really been able to deal with the build-up of, of the financial booms. 
The second reason is that there is little that macroprudential measures can do to deal with the debt trap in those economies that have already faced the boom are now in the bust and basically are trying to get, get out of that. Because in that context, it is basically, you may have deleveraging in the private sector, which you need in order to be able to resume growth, but at the same time, you're going to have re-leveraging in the public sector. Financial crisis and financial bust tend to cause havoc with the fiscal, with the fiscal, with the fiscal accounts. The third reason, and this is something that I would like to emphasize, um, is that it does not require, such a strategy does not require a change in the traditional objectives that monetary policy has. What it does require is a change in the time frame over which those objectives are pursued. Here we're talking about output and we're talking about inflation. I, I told you before the risk of a good financial, you know, of low inflation, benign disinflation turning into bad disinflation when the boom turns to a bust. But what happens is that any, sh any, any tensions that tend to arise between price stability and um, financial stability, quote unquote, in the short run, they tend to disappear, vanish as the horizon lengthens for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And this is a point that maybe we could discuss further later on. And the final reason, I, see, I, I, I would say, is that this kind of policy can be done successfully. But remember, I'm here, I'm just talking about monetary policy, but I'm always having in mind very much monetary policy taking part of a, just a role within a broader framework in which other policies are playing a role. So let me just give you an illustration of this. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we go beyond the simple reduced form measures of financial cycle that I used earlier, and we build into the, uh, the financial cycle, um, it, we decompose the financial cycle into two sets of variables um, for uh, the household and firms aggregated that in the data have very stable long-run relationships. One is a proxy for leverage, which is roughly a measure of debt to assets, think of this as a stock variable, and the other is a proxy for the debt service ratio, which is interpayments plus amortization divided by income. This is a flow variable. So deviations of these variables from their long-run relationships or gaps interact, and when embedded in an otherwise standard macroeconomic system, are found to have first order impact on expenditures, particularly the debt service ratio, and can result in financial bust with even permanent losses in terms of output. And in fact, they actually trace pretty well the Great Recession out of sample. Now take these gaps as measures of financial equilibrium. We then close the system with an augmented Taylor rule that responds to a measure of financial equilibrium in addition to the output gap and inflation. And moreover, we allow these measures, these financial proxies, to provide information about both potential output and, and the natural rate in, in the filter system, in addition to inflation. And then we do a number of alternative uh, simulations uh, based on US data. Remember, our system nests the, the traditional one. And we come up with five, five findings. The first is that financial gaps are key in estimates of output and natural interest rates. Their information content is considerably larger than that of inflation, and this is simply the mirror image of the fact that the Phillips curve tends to be quite flat. Second, the augmented rule leads to output gains with little change in inflation, and it does so because it smooths the financial cycle. Third, it is important to lean early and respond systematically to the financial cycle and not to wait for the signs of, of obvious financial imbalances, big exuberance to be, to be there, because if you act by then and you basically just follow a traditional rule all, all the, the rest of the time, it will simply be too late. And you will actually possibly even precipitate the problem you're trying to avoid. Fourth, estimates of the natural rate that come out of this system tend to be higher, and in particular tend to fall by less when the central bank responds to the financial cycle. And finally, there are sizable deviations of policy, of the policy rate from the natural rate, which means that the uh, information content of the natural rate, even if you allow for this broader definition that includes financial equilibrium, is not that great. Now, if one accepts this analysis, 
and decides to implement a more financial stability oriented or financial stability friendly, if you like, monetary policy, the key adjustment that would be necessary in current monetary policy frameworks is to ensure that they provide sufficient room for maneuver for policy to respond in, in a more systematic, although not necessarily very violent or strong way. And here, there are a number of considerations. There is no one size fits all. The answers are country specific. All options that have their pros and cons. And all of these have already been implemented or, or proposed. Let me just mention four before I conclude. The first and simplest one is to lengthen the horizon over which to pursue a given inflation target, which is basically what the Norway and the uh, RBA have done. The second is to shift from point targets to a soft band or to widen the bands. And this actually has been done by the Riksbank recently, going back to a system that he had before, reinterpreting the system. But I have to say that they've done it mainly to make it very clear that they, they, it's very hard to fine tune inflation, not necessarily to pursue the strategy, strategy that I've just mentioned. The third possibility is to lower the point targets or the bands. And this is basically what the Bank of Korea has done in the presence of persistent shortfalls of inflation from the target. They've, but they've reduced it from three to two, which made life easier because this was the international standard. And the final option, of course, is to change the mandate. And by changing the mandate, what I mean is changing the central bank law, for instance, to include financial stability as an objective, which has been proposed by an independent commission now in Norway. But I think one should realize a, a couple of things. There is no question that possibly adding financial stability as, a, as part, of in, part of the mandate for a central bank in its monetary policy functions could help insulate the central bank from political pressures to reduce interest rates in a context in which they have shortfalls of inflation below target, but a big buildup of problems in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in terms of debt and, and in terms of financial, financial vulnerabilities. But as I said earlier, mandates uh, as written in the law are quite vague and the offspring of the times in which they were written. So that you can, there is very often sufficient leeway in the mandates to, to pursue these policies. Moreover, changing the mandates can be quite unpredictable. You know what you may be asking for, but you don't know what's going to come out of the uh, parliamentary process. And moreover, and I think at the end of the day, the lens or analytical framework that you use in order to understand how the economy works is much more important, I would say, than the mandate. Imagine a situation in which you, they give you a financial stability mandate, but then what happens is that the inflation is shooting up, the financial system is weak, and then the central bank comes under pressure to reduce interest rates in order to deal with the financial sector problems. Well, that is not the answer. I mean, the answer, of course, is to try to deal with the financial system problems directly through other policies. So let me conclude. Central banks have been caught in a kind of pincer movement, caught between the emergence of disruptive financial cycles on the one hand, and an inflation rate that has proved rather insensitive to economic slack. And this is happening as we speak today. This raises risks. It raises risks for the economy in the form of the risk of entrenching in instability and, and the debt trap that I mentioned earlier. And it also raises risks for monetary policy frameworks, which may found not to be fully fit for purpose. These were clearly the right frameworks when central banks were trying to bring inflation down and to uh, consolidate those gains. There is a question whether they are just the best possible frameworks that we could use these days in order to deal with a different set of problems, the different set of problems that we are facing. If so, a number of analytical and practical adjustments may be desirable. First, the need to reconsider the natural interest rate, its analytical basis, and as a guide for, for policy. Second, the need for monetary policy to take the financial cycle more systematically into account. And here I highlighted the need, the importance of moving early as opposed to moving strongly and, and late. And third, the need for greater room for maneuver in current policy frameworks. I outlined ver various options, and each of them should be evaluated carefully. Thank you very much.